I'm at the Cap Scotiabank Investment Symposium 2015. That's a lot of words, but basically means the oil patch comes to Toronto looking to talk investment. And who better to talk about that than our friend Peter Herzakian, the Chief Economist at ARC Financial. Great to see you here in yeah, Toronto. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, tell me a little bit about the conference. I've covered it in the past for the Sun News Network. Right. I mean, we're literally outside from City Hall, Toronto. Sure. That's a long way from the oil sands and the, the frack sites of uh, Western Canada. What, what right. goes on here? Well, this is the biggest investment conference annually in Canada. And so I come here because I want to understand right from the ground level what the companies are thinking and doing. I follow a lot of the macro trends, but I like to be able to substantiate what's going on by listening to all the participants here. As you know, it's a very difficult time in the business, and so we want to get the, uh, the, uh, the, the pressure gauge of the industry here. Well, let's talk about some of those difficulties. Obviously, the biggest one is the price of oil. I mean, right. until about six, nine months ago, it was around 100 bucks. It's half that now. I think we know why, but is there a conventional understanding and do you have, do you have any insights that, I mean, is it basically OPEC trying to put some of their competitors out of business? Well, it's not only OPEC. I mean, I think there's a lot of competitors. We are in a price war and you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to know that this is a price there war. Is a cartel, I mean, there, is, there, there is a cartel though. There is a cartel, but yeah. whenever in any industry, whether it's you know, two for one pizzas or one dollar airline seats, yeah. whenever the price of a commodity goes down below the marginal cost of replacing it, yeah. Uh, and you go to you know, basically zero cash flow, uh, you know you're in a price war. Yeah. And right now it's an all-out duking it out internationally, duking it out domestically uh, to see who ultimately is going to take, uh, take some of the prize that you get at the end of the price war, which is more market share. Yeah. Now, when Saudi Arabia pokes a hole in the ground, the oil comes up pretty easily. Right. They don't have environmental standards. They don't pay the same uh, unionized labor rate we do. They don't have the regulatory. Like, there's so many... Uh, natural reasons their production cost is lower, plus political and institutional reasons. But still, they, those Saudis got used to $80, $90, $100 barrel oil too. Even if it didn't cost them as much, they're surely running huge government deficits too, right? Well, they are running a deficit in terms of their social cost structure. I would actually classify the Saudis as a more sophisticated player amongst the global collective of other types of players, whether it's the Venezuelans, Nigerians, North Africans, yeah, Venezuela, Angola, I mean, food, you know. Food rationing now. It's I mean, food rationing. How can that happen? Uh, in, you know, they're on teetering potentially on the point of default on some of their loans. Um, this is hurting a lot of big state-owned producers around the world. Mm -hmm. So while we feel it here in Canada, uh, it also is indicative of what's going on in the rest of the world where many countries are much more dependent upon the revenue than we are. Now, let's talk about how these low prices have impacted Alberta and other jurisdictions like Saskatchewan, BC, and even right. offshore in the Atlantic. Right. Right. One thing that we do see is layoffs, but something we don't see because it's harder to measure is a plan that was deferred, a project that was delayed or scrapped. Right, right. Can you help measure for us what the impact has been on actual people being given a pink slip, a layoff, or you know, being terminated versus a huge expansion that would have created 10,000 right. jobs being right. delayed a decade. Well, I don't keep track of the, the, the layoff count, but I do keep track of the project deferrals and delayers, and that's significant because what we have seen globally and in Canada, an acceleration of the delay uh, and cancellation of major projects. In the last, mm, certainly, six to nine months, we've seen 10 up to a dozen oil sands projects uh, that have been delayed or canceled. What's the capital for, for, value of that? Would be tens of, I mean, stat yeah, oil? It would be ten. Oh, yeah, in, in the, you know, it would be in the nine figure, uh, ten, no, eight figure uh, type, you know, tens of billions of dollars. But these are projects, as you pointed out earlier, I mean, that represent barrels that would have come on in the late teens into the 2020s. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's employment deferred, that is barrels deferred. Uh, and by the way, I mean, this is not only all sounds exclusive. I mean, this is big mega projects offshore North yeah. Sea, yeah. offshore other parts of the world. And so actually what it's creating is a potential deficit of oil uh, in the future, yeah. three to five years from now is a bigger story. Well, are there people coming in and saying, all right, every, all these producers are in trouble now. They got cash flow troubles. I'm a bank. I'm, a, I'm an equity fund. I got some dough. Let me come in and buy these things on the cheap right. because this low price won't last long. It may be 50 bucks now, but I predict it's going to go up to 70, 80, 90, and now it's, it's a good time to get in. Well, there are those people that are coming in. Uh, however, they are somewhat disappointed because the buyers are smart too, and they're saying, well, I'm not going to give you the crown jewels at these low prices because I know the price is going to oh, go so up. Oh, so the sellers are smart. Yeah, so yeah. That there's a gap between what the buyers are bidding yeah. and what the sellers are asking. Yeah. 
uh, or sorry, the other way around. And so the, uh, the, the net effect of that is that we have to wait till the pain bites a bit more before you get sort of a convergence of the bid and ask prices of these assets and until you start to see some transactions. Well, the market is naturally correcting. I mean, uh, these things will level out over time. Uh, perhaps the low oil prices will juice the economy, which will demand more oil, which will create well, more demand. That's already happening. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the driving numbers, the gasoline consumption numbers in the United States are now at their highest level that they were in six years. Uh, this summer driving season is going to be elevated. Uh, in parts of the rest of the world, you can see uh, consumption taking up. But production is still going up. And you might ask, well, why is that? And the reason is, well, as I said, we are in a price war. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in. In the early phases of a price war, the first reaction of the producers is to produce more because they're trying to offset right. their lost revenue, yeah. uh, pay their oh, bills, pay the banker, pay their employees. Uh, at some point, the gig is up uh, and there's no money left. If these prices continue, I'd say you're looking toward the end of the year into ne early next year. Uh, is when the real serious structural issues will start to show. Now it's tough to predict the future, but yeah. that is sort of the job of an economist, especially sure. in your business. Right. Here we are, it's uh, April 2015, the year's slipping by quickly. Where do you think oil's going to be January 1st, 2016, if you had to guess? Uh, I would say, let, let me say, that the actually pinpointing the number is difficult, but I would give you sort of more of a direction a range, of magnitude. Yeah. Uh, what, we're, what we'd probably expect to see is some firming up of the prices toward the third and fourth quarter. But it's going to be choppy. It's going to go up, and there's going to be disbelief that it's going to last. It's going to go down and go choppy and, yeah. and percolating upward. And then even if it goes upward, the rigs are going to go back out, yeah. and the market's going to think, well, oh, some more supplies supply, coming. Yeah. It's going to come down again. I think, again, I, I mentioned earlier, I think the real issues start to show themselves three years out, yeah. okay. or five years out. But still, give yeah. me a price. I mean, right. I mean, and that's relevant because you've sure. got the Alberta budget, which, is, yeah. which right. depends on the price of oil. You've got the right. federal budget. To a large degree, people in Eastern Canada forget how much of that federal budget came from royalties and taxes right. and income taxes, corporate taxes from Alberta. Right. And a lot of those budgets, a key number is their prediction for the price of oil. So I want to pin you down. Give yeah, me well, number. you know, it's a, you know, you want to pin me down, I'll, I'll give you the, I, I think it's going to be 60, 65 plus for the, for the North American benchmark WTI January 1st. Yeah. Uh, you know, how firm that will hold is going to depend on a whole bunch of factors. And I, I, I think, though, that you know, getting back to the, uh, the international situation with some of these countries is that you know, some of them potentially are going to start to uh, also feel the pain of the impact of low prices on their social fabric. Yeah. Right. I, I want you to know, switch gears. We talked about yeah. the, the, all this market competition. That's one issue. But something that I follow closely, because I, I love following the anti-oil sands activists and tracking the money. Sure, yeah. What I always note, Peter, is that they're never criticizing the Saudi Aramco's, Venezuela's, Pedavesa, like right. the biggest oil companies in the world. Most Canadians never heard their names. I bet right. you not one in a hundred Canadians, right, right. even when I say Pedavesa, what's right, that? Because right. who would possibly know the name of the state-owned oil company in Venezuela? Sure. But it's much bigger than any private sector company. Oh yeah. Here's my question. These anti-oil, anti-pipeline activists, mm -hmm. they only attack Canadian and American oil and European sure. oil. They never sure. attack those state-owned OPEC oil sure. companies. How effective have they been at bottlenecking and demarketing right. the oil sands? I think they're winning. Yeah, no, I wouldn't debate that. I think they've done a, a, a good job. Uh, the thing is that it has catalyzed some what I would call unintended consequences. So by, for example, uh, delaying Keystone XL, we've seen the rise of the railroads. Right. Right. And, and so the sort of uh, uh, one-dimensional strategies of blocking pipelines uh, has led to these spin-out consequences that are not necessarily optimal. Yeah. In fact, arguably, uh, it's very suboptimal to have all this oil now going via rail uh, rather than the more efficient pipeline. I want to ask one more question. You've been very yeah. generous with yeah. your time. I look at Keystone XL. I personally don't think that's going to get built until the next president. Would you agree with me on I that? I would agree. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about a couple other pipelines I got my eye on. I know you yeah. do too. The Northern Gateway Pipeline. Right. That's the Greenfield project right. that goes to Kitimat, BC. Yeah. That was approved more than a year ago, right. but there's no shovel in the ground yet. Right. Uh, I look at the Energy East pipeline, a big project that would go all the way out to New Brunswick. I see delays there. Right. And then there's the twinning of the Kinder Morgan Trans, Trans Mountain, Mountain pipe. That's an yeah. existing pipe right. that goes to Vancouver, mm -hmm. really. Right. All these things look either bogged down or slowed down. 
partly regulatory, partly protest. Are those still alive? Are those three projects still alive? They are. They are alive. They are, they're, they're alive. I think they're going to take longer than we think, unfortunately. But let me say that you know, this regulatory issue of, of being bogged down and, and social license type issues are not exclusive to the oil business. I mean, even trying to build wind farms and other types of energy infrastructure projects and even non-energy infrastructure big projects is uh, getting bogged down. Why? Well, because we have, I believe, uh, a fundamental problem with uh, eroding trust in our regulatory system. I think that's part of it, but I think that's the official excuse the other side wants to trot it out. I, mm -hmm. I note that the Keystone, let me give you an example. Sure. I, I looked at the National Energy Board of Canada, mm -hmm. their review of the Keystone Excel pipeline. I think there were, you could count on one hand, uh, it's worth of fingers, the number of people who went and testified and objected to it. Right. So it was a slam dunk. It, it, it was so quick, there were maybe a couple of days of hearings. Right. There was no problem with the regulatory process. The reason why the Canadian approval of Keystone XL went through like that is simply because the big foreign lobby groups, the Greenpeace's, mm -hmm, the David mm -hmm. Suzuki Foundations, sure. the Tides Foundations, didn't say, let's throw a hundred million bucks at stopping that. Now they threw it on the US side, but I actually don't think the problems with our regulators as much as it's a fake problem ginned up by thousands of bad faith sock puppets. Mm -hmm. Now, am I too radical in my thinking? I mean, I'm not saying we can't improve bureaucracy. Believe me, I hate red tape too. <laughs> but if you look at how the Keystone Excel was approved compared to Northern Gateway, I think the only difference is you didn't have tens of millions of dollars of foreign funding coming in to stop Keystone Excel Canada. Sure, sure. I, I, I guess I would answer by saying it's complex. It, 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 you can't just point to one thing. Yeah. All we do know is that historically, history being, I don't know, uh, greater than 10 years ago, yeah. getting approval for pipelines and other infra pro infrastructure projects is formulaic. Yeah. You know, fill in all the paperwork, take it to the regulator, the yeah. regulator comes back, says fix this, and then we'll rubber stamp it back and forth. Well, that's how we they do it with say, roads yeah, and, and yeah, power sure, lines sure. And, norm and, sure. and normal things. I think the idea of, of anathematizing a pipe is so absurd. I mean, pipes are an ancient technology. Go back to the aqueducts. Okay. Pipes are safe, normal. <laughs> the idea of, oh, a pipeline. I, I think but, it's a bizarre thing that we've turned it into a scandalous no. thing. Well, I, I agree. But I mean, I think that I like to even elevate the discussion beyond pipe because, again, I, I'd like to say that it is not just about pipes and uh, plants and refineries yeah. and things. I mean, we're talking about any kind of big project yeah. where localized groups can become self-appointed yeah. regulators. Nuclear, they can become self-appointed regulators. Yeah. Right. I think we let them do undemocratically what they couldn't block through democracy. But Peter, it's been great to talk. I yeah. could talk to you all day. Yeah. No, I know you good. want to get yeah. back to the conference. It's great to see you. Yeah. I am glad you're here to, uh, to observe, but also to tell the story from Alberta here in Toronto, right. because yeah. I think sometimes folks in Toronto, because they don't naturally pass through the oil sands, it's not mm -hmm. on anyone's way to some place, they maybe get disinformation, so I'm glad you're here to tell them the facts, too. It's nice to I'm see here, you too. Again. Thank you, Ezra. Thanks, Peter. Okay, bye-bye. For the Rebel.media, I'm Ezra Levant.